was there any like I said, any hesitation at all about, you know, psychedelics, you know, is, is that really something that can help me? There wasn't really, uh, yeah. again, because I saw it firsthand with Riley. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm seeing it firsthand from a, from somebody that w comes from the same cloth as me. Yeah. We, we shared the same role, uh, as our profession. You know, there's a lot of anxiety. Uh, I think if anybody said they loved and looked forward to every fight, I think they'd be lying to you. Yeah. I think Riley, even one of the tougher guys in the NHL uh, in his prime, he would get nervous before a fight. What? I mean, the, the and then for me, being five foot ten, giving up a foot and sixty to eighty pounds on some of these guys I'm fighting, like I didn't sleep unless I self medicated for four nights before I knew this team was coming in and I may have to fight one of five guys so i just it carries a lot of anxiety with that role so riley and i share that same we know what our roles entailed and what we had to go through to survive in the nhl Kevin, thank you so much for stopping by and joining us here on the Psychedelic Spotlight Podcast. We are honored to have you here as our guest today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, David. Thanks for having me. I'm very happy to have you here and a uh, lot to talk about. Uh, yeah, I think your story is uh, incredibly inspirational in terms of your journey of healing through psychedelics and psychedelic assisted therapy. So we're looking forward to being able to uh, share that story with our audience here. Uh, you know, Kevin, you've become part of a growing list of retired professional athletes who are really crediting psychedelics and perhaps more specifically psychedelic assisted therapy as playing a critical role in your healing journey and helping you heal through uh, many of the different debilitating physical and mental health uh, conditions and challenges that you've faced here over the last several years. And now you, you played uh, about 10, about a little over 10 years of professional, uh, professional hockey, which, uh, spanned across multiple professional leagues, uh, the, uh, the OHL, the ECHL, the AHL, and then of course the granddaddy of them all, uh, the NHL, as you remember of the New York Islanders. And, you know, before we start to get into that conversation about your experience with psychedelics and psychedelic assisted therapy, I want to help paint a picture of, you know, who you are and what the game of hockey meant to you, because you made it to the top, you know, you made it all the way to the NHL. And I think a lot of people don't understand how difficult that is. And the fact that very few people who play hockey ever make it to that level. And I don't think you get there without an incredible amount of talent, skill, and then, of course, dedication and commitment to the game itself. So I want to hear from you in terms of, you know, what the game of hockey meant to you going back to your youth, uh, your teenage years, your, your early adulthood year, because I think it plays an important part in your story. As we know, your career would come to a grinding halt and in in 2006 with an injury uh, that we'll talk about. But I want to help people understand, you know, what hockey meant to you. Well, hockey was my life uh my dad played professionally he played one game in the nhl for minnesota uh my mom she competed internationally as a figure skater she was third in canada um and when i was younger my mom teached figure skating and my dad was my hockey coach so i i basically grew up in the rink mm -hmm. i was there non-stop it was just a a big hockey sports family the collie family uh my dad's brothers and my sister, my mom, everyone were just very in tune with. We love sports, baseball, hockey, golf, um, all of them. But that's kind of who we are. We're just sports fanatics. I was a rink rat. Uh, I came out of my mom's womb with skates on, uh, ready to go. Um, and that's all I knew from, I can remember from, you know, when I, an infant, toddler, growing up. I, I just knew I wanted to play in the NHL and that's all I ever thought about um, until I actually got that phone call um, way down the road. But um, 
for me, I was just super, super competitive family, uh, always w winning, winning, yeah. winning, winning was the main thing. Uh, um, and the losses hit hard. Uh, so that's just a little bit about my character and how I was raised. Just, you know, team first, always, it's always about wins, um, which makes you ultra competitive. And I, yeah. I, I thank my dad for instilling that in me because I, if I didn't have that competitiveness, it's super hard to get to the peak at your, your sport. Um, and for, for me to, to work my way and, and fight my way and do whatever it takes to get to live my dream. Um, I wouldn't change any of it. Uh, it was truly uh, worth all the hard work and the uh, blade up uh, faces and, and stuff like that. Um, but the, in a nutshell, that's just me. I, I was a rink rat. Hockey was my life. Um, and then unfortunately, you know, on January 6th, um, sorry, January 31st of, of 06, um, freak accident and I break my neck and that was it. And yeah my identity right then was ripped out from from me i didn't know it at the time but everybody since i was young um kevin Colley's the hockey player kevin Colley's the hockey player it's always just it was just always attached to me and <clears throat> so I, I lost who i was i didn't know i'm not a hockey player no more i right. kind of lost my identity um and then i got into coaching pro um well, before we get there, let, let's let's talk if, if we can. Sorry, Kevin. You know, let's talk a little bit about you know uh, the injury itself, and you know your your professional you know career as far as a player coming to uh, such an abrupt ending. Um, because again, you know, you, you talked about hockey kind of being in your blood, and it's something that you know you eat, live, breathe, sleep for so many years, and you wake up one morning, and all of a sudden you're in a life where that's no longer the central focus of your life. Um, so that's, that's gotta be a shock. So, you know, walk us through that first, you know, those first couple of, you know, days, maybe weeks, you know, after the injury. And can you share a little bit for folks out there who may not be familiar with the injury itself, what actually happened in that game in January of 06? Well, I, you know, I was an energy guy, you know, I, I uh, played very physical, reckless, uh, yeah. a lot of the times, uh, reckless for for my own body and other uh opponents bodies just disregard for health uh, or injuries um and i just pulled my dad in it was his first time at nassau Col uh coliseum on long island i flew him in um and i just it was a free guy so i went to go hit uh, jamie heward from washington and the last second kind of jumped out of the way and i was coming over his right shoulder and his stick was just still laying there and just perfectly caught my uh two legs and tripped me up and i just superman it into the boards and that was it uh, um, i knew right then that i just played my last shift in the nhl um you, you know lost, i didn't lose. loss of feeling or i lost a lot yeah. all my feeling was gone but i could move my extremities so i knew i wasn't paralyzed but it felt like from my earlobes down i was on fire um so i laid there for a while and I know where exactly where my dad's sitting and they bring out the stretcher and I'm like, I know I, you just got to get me off the ice. Um, if it's not serious, the, as, you know, I think it is just get me off the ice and I don't want to scare my dad. Anyways, I didn't get taken off in the gurney. Um, I had, uh, Brad Lukwich and Eric Goddard help me off the ice all the way down to the other end. And the old Nassau Coliseum doesn't have all the high tech stuff now. I had by myself, I had nobody assisting me, by the way. Um, I walked all the way around the other side of the rink in the basement to basically where I got hurt to the x-ray machine. They took the x-rays. I walked all the way back around the other side of the rink, again, in the basement to our locker room, the training room uh, by myself. And when I got to the training room, that's when everybody come running in the doctors, trainers, everything it was scissors and started just cutting my gear off, strap my head down. And then two hours later, I'm in a halo. Wow. And I call my dad and I'm like, what is going on? He's like, it's Kev, it's okay. You got to do this just to make sure you're going to stabilize your, your spine and not do any more damage. But so it happened like super quick. Um, didn't have time to think about it. Didn't have time to uh, protect myself. But in a nutshell, that's that's kind of how how it happened. It is uh, just a freak accident. 
Um, you know, I don't know if I had it got taken off on a stretcher. Um, maybe I did more damage on walking all that way by myself. I'm not sure. Um, that's something I'll, ne I'll, I'll never know, but, um, yeah, that was just, uh, and, and then a couple major surgeries, they took a bone from my hip, fused it to, you know, C3 through seven. I got a bunch of plate screws and pins back there. So I lost some mobility obviously. Um, but I'm walking and I, you won't hear me complain about really my neck soreness tightness um or a little bit of pain just because i know i'm, I'm blessed to be walking so yeah uh, it, yeah a lot of players unfortunately you know um aren't as as you know fortunate in instances like that you know i would imagine though you know with the pain uh comes pain medication prescriptions um was that a part of your your regimen uh, in the months and even years after the injury it was so they, they had me on Oxycontin right after I mm. uh, broke my neck, which, uh, you know what, the, actually the bone they took from my hip was more painful than my broken neck uh, because I was uh, immobilized and I just had to, I was always on my back where they took the bone from. Uh, so I was on that for about six weeks and I was proud of myself. I, I got off those sooner than the doctors even recommended because I didn't want to be on them. Uh, and then I go back to Canada, I uh, take a couple months off, and I'm, I'm now out of the halo into a soft race. I'm starting to feel better. I don't know where I'm going with my life. Mm -hmm. um, again, a lot of confusion with no guidance now. I'm not in the locker room with my teammates. I don't. I felt like I had nobody to lean on. Yeah. Um, but then I got a call to start coaching uh, hockey professionally, and I moved down to uh, Utah to coach the Utah Grizzlies. And I started taking pain pills again. And they're very easy to come by, especially when you're a coach uh, in professional sports and you have team doctors, they are okay. Um, at least when I was coaching, they might've changed their policies. They might be a little stricter now, I'm not sure. But for me, you basically could get whatever you want mm -hmm. at uh, like TikTok. So I was uh, on pain medicine for five years uh, I couldn't get off them and then went to a, a rehab spot in Florida um, and got off them it was great and then I just went into a real deep depression and got on the medication uh, of anxiety and depression uh, medic any depressants but I was I was self-medicating with a ton of alcohol as well I was a functioning alcoholic all this while being a coach I'm coach professional athletes um with not being real clear-headed no. you know um so deal, just dealt with the, a lot of the once i got hooked on the pain pills it just seemed like everything just started kind of even though i got off them it was just what the next thing and then it was the right. pharmaceutical drugs and then that's when kind of everything changed and started to I couldn't get out of the fog and being masked and had no feelings and, and not being present with my kids. Just my mind was scattered, just always constantly fighting with myself. Um, and then, you know, that lasted until about two months ago. Yeah. Is there, is there, you know, a lot of us who have, who've gone through, you know, whether it's battles with depression or anxiety, even PTSD, a lot of us can look back and, there's certain points where we say, my God, that, that was such a low point. And I, how did I even make it through that? Um, is there any, any particular memory of anything that you were going through at that point in time uh, when you were struggling with anxiety, depression, of course, your alcoholism, where you look at and you're like, man, how did I even, how did I even make it through that? It gives me chills to think about it. I don't know how I, I mean, I was waving the towel yeah. like, many times as I was in a real deep rabbit hole and I kept digging deeper and deeper and I waved the towel a, a few times. Uh, I just didn't throw it in the ring. Mm -hmm. um, and then just the most recent one was, uh, you know, in June when I called Riley and I was, I had my towel waving again. It was just, uh, you know, just couldn't do it anymore yeah just paralyzed i was in bed i'd lost a lot of weight um 
and just was not in a good spot. And it's hard to explain until you, you know, you kind of experience it. It's, it's, I wouldn't work, wish it on my, my worst enemy is you, you really, you're, you're a, a prisoner in your own mind. And I know you've heard that before, but it's the truth. It's, and then you, you've got the, the concussions and the, the TBIs that I had and the, and the PTSD and all that mixed in with the bad pharmaceutical drugs. And it was just like, scream at the top of my lungs but nobody can hear me um and it, it was just such a lost feeling of just going through the motions of just constantly fighting with myself yeah. and not being present around you know my wife and kids and it just uh so i made the call to riley because i watched the uh, thing on espn the peace of mind yeah mm -hmm. peace of mind was outstanding and and riley and i um played against each other uh we had uh, a couple of altercations against one another obviously he's a much bigger stronger tougher guy than me but um i was willing to uh at least give him a shot but so i reached out to him because we shared a lot of things in common uh before he got into the psychedelics uh he was having the same symptoms yeah um so i reached out to riley and i'm 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 grateful and blessed that he he was there for to answer my call because that was I, I don't know where i was going and um you know and, and watching podcast with um you know my son just got shipped off to the army um a month ago so he he does a lot of sean ryan uh podcast mm -hmm. and he's big into the psychedelics and and stuff like that and then i watched the episode where he was had all the same symptoms i was feeling at that time and then he went to a retreat and it changed everything and i'm like wow this guy's a navy seal six psychedelics changed his world Riley Cote, this guy's been through feeling the exact same thing, self-medicating, all that. He's changed. Maybe there is help out here. Like yeah. Maybe this medicine is like, I've tried every drug on the shelf from the doctors. Nothing was working. I just kept on getting worse and worse and worse over 18 years. And I knew this is what I had to do. Yeah. Uh, and I truly believe with the journeys that I went on and the medicine doing its thing and not just the medicine, but the education I got while I was in Jamaica on uh, just being mindful and, and being grounded and just so much just really now intrigued me. Right. Uh, where before nothing intrigued me, like nothing moved my needle before Jamaica. Now little things are starting to move my needle. Um, uh, and so I took, that medicine, the uh, psilocybin with the education and all the information I gathered and I come back now, I'm doing the daily practice, waking up early, working out, meditating, doing all that to build those trenches of the neural pathways mm -hmm. now. now like there, there's pathways, but I have to do the work to get them deeper, where it's just my automatic thoughts come out how I want, not yeah. what I'm used to. I get to kind of recondition my brain so it's just a an a daily thing that, I, that i'm working on was there any hesitation in, in in making the the decision to go to the retreat um assuming it's the wake retreats in, in jamaica that we know uh, riley cote uh has been a part of for for a while now and of course which was featured on the espn documentary peace of mind which i want to encourage everyone out there please if you get the opportunity to take a look at it it's available on espn plus but when you were hearing about psychedelics, um, you know, I'm assuming, you know, I mean, we talked about this before we got on here, you know, we're around the same age. Um, so we grew up, you know, kind of around the same propaganda out there, the same, you know, educational information where drugs were just painted in such a negative light. Uh, all drugs were bad. You know, I mean, heroin was just as bad as mushrooms, which was just as bad as marijuana and just as bad as crack cocaine. Uh, was there any like I said, any hesitation at all about, you know, psychedelics, you know, is, is that really something that can help me? There wasn't really, uh, yeah. again, because I saw it firsthand with Riley. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm seeing it firsthand from, a from somebody that w comes from the same cloth as me. Yeah. We, we shared the same role, uh, as our profession. You know, there's a lot of anxiety. Uh, I think if anybody said they loved and looked forward to every fight, I think they'd be lying to you. Yeah. I think Riley, even one of the tougher guys in the NHL uh, in his prime, he would get nervous before a fight. Right. I mean, the, the and then for me, being five foot ten, 
given up a foot and 60 to 80 pounds on some of these guys I'm fighting. Like I didn't sleep unless I self-medicated for four nights before I knew this team was coming in and I may have to fight one of five guys. So I just, it carries a lot of anxiety with that role. So Riley and I share that same, we know what our roles entailed and what we had to go through to survive in the NHL. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very draining mentally. It, it yeah. really is. Um, it wears you down, but uh, just, yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't have any, any, any doubts at all that I knew that this is what I had to do. Um, I did the first journey. It was light. Okay. And, talk about, okay. talk about that first journey. Like what, what, what specifically is this first journey for you? So the first journey was, uh, we got to Jamaica on a Tuesday. It was on mm -hmm. a Wednesday. Uh, you just don't take, it's not as powerful. Um, so you get a little bit more visual and then we'll go into the, the second journey where it's not visual. It's down in the roots, but the, the, the first one was uh, kind of warm and fuzzy, playful, feeling good for me. Anyways, that was my experience. Uh, um, there was a few things I took out of it was like my brain had a hundred hands, tentacles that were just clapping, like all like a hundred little tentacles of hands just clapping. And I was like, Oh, they're saying, thank you for finally giving them the medicine that it needs, mm -hmm. not the pharmaceutical drugs. So it was like basically saying, good job, Kevin. Thank you for finally giving me the medicine that I've been needing for so long which was just a powerful um, thing I picked up on. Um, you know, I had a couple moments, like I didn't, I don't think I laughed hard in 18 years, more than 10 times. Like I was just that depressed and a zombie. Uh, I just got the giggles and it felt so good. So I got up and I went for a little walk. So I didn't disrupt the other uh, tribe members and let out just, you know, a minute of, just great laughter uh, coming right from the spine because I was feeling it and I hadn't laughed like that in a long, long time. And it felt amazing. Um, so those are the two like main things that stuck out uh, towards the end of that journey. I started to battle with myself again because I don't think I was where I thought I was going to get to, but I knew that I was just kind of the warm up, let the medicine kind of get in your system and, and get a feel for it. And then the second journey was going to be, all right, now we're going to get you down to your roots. Yeah. Which the day before I was telling, um, you know, the doctors and everybody, I said like, take me to Mars, get me, get me wherever I need to go. Let's I'm here. You know what I'm, I'm struggling with. However much you got to give me, get, let me go. Uh, little did I know that I didn't go up. I went down to my roots and it was beautiful. It was amazing. Um, a lot of everything was just truth. Matter of fact, truth from my upbringing to friends and family back home, uh, connecting the dots with why some family members are struggling right now um, to my spiritual encounter with the higher power was the best feeling I've ever had in my life. It was the purest, joyous, most innocent I've ever felt. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like I was levitating and I was, uh, I don't like saying this word exorcism because it's a negative, but it was like I was under his power and I used up so much energy uh, with all the electricity and, and um, energy I was using. I was, I could not believe that feeling when I had got touched by the higher power, it was just, I've never cried joyful tears in my life. And I couldn't stop crying joyful tears, joyful tears. And I just started fist pumping. Like, this is amazing. Like, I can't believe I'm, I'm getting the experiences. So I sat up and I just wrote my journal. Mm -hmm. Holy shit. Something big just fucking happened. Holy shit. Um, and I knew exactly what happened. And then uh, the Stanley cup appeared oh. and instantly I was like, cause I always wanted to win the Stanley cup and, and I have great friends that won multiple of them. I, I never got to experience, but now in that moment, I knew it was okay to never lift that Stanley cup because what I just felt 
you nobody that's left of the Stanley Cup has just experienced what I just felt. Yeah. It was that that it was that it was that powerful and mind blowing. I my my mind was just blown. I was smiling, just couldn't believe it. But so that just gave me um, validation that I didn't have mm-hmm. to do whatever to to win that Stanley Cup because what I just experience was way way beyond lifting a silver trophy yeah um and i'm not taking anything away from winning that standing cup because i know what the players go through and how hard it is of course and and, and the war it is so i know it's that feeling is truly heaven to them but i actually got the feeling of heaven um on my journey uh and if you don't mind i'd like to just keep going a little bit um so we did the, the first journey on the Wednesday. The Thursday was integration and we went to the beach. Um, and I didn't even know, I was walking back in for my swim and I got hit from behind from a wave and I got whiplash. And I wake up Friday and I can't even move my neck. Like whiplash and with all you know my injury, obviously that's, mm. it was, I was in a lot of pain. And then so to get back into the journey is after I had that uh, spiritual encounter with the higher power and then the Stanley Cup, I sat up. Um, I, I told you I write that uh, down on my journal. Then I felt this pressure on my chest and it was the higher power again saying, lay, lay back down. Now that you know I've touched you, you know I'm real. You believe in me now. Watch what I can do. And it was like he took a, a big syringe and put it on the top of my neck and sucked out all that pain I was in and I could feel the pain coming up through my neck and leaving the next day I was pain-free again is that a coincidence absolutely not uh because I've hurt my neck since my injury and I've been laid up for a week or two back in my neck brace sometimes and here it is where I'm waking up the next day where I was almost, like I was moving like this the day of the, the journey. The next day I'm moving like everything's fine. And then my again, just mind blown. It's really remarkable. Yeah. It's incredible. And I mean, your your story is, you know, it's one that reminds me a lot of uh, you know, other professional athletes who have, you know, shared their stories. And what stands out for me is, you know, you talk about finding yourself in a place where you're laughing uncontrollably, uh, you're crying tears of joy. What I get from a lot of professional athletes, especially those that played in such demanding sports, such as hockey, football, or, you know, even MMA, you have to be this tough warrior for so long. It's ingrained into your, your, your being and into your life for so many years. And then you find yourself in a place where you kind of shed that. It's almost like, you know, taking off your gear there in the locker room and you have that moment of like, Ooh, wow, that feels good. Is that, is that kind of what this whole experience has been like, you know, kind of shedding this persona or, you know, this, these expectations and this pressure of having to be a certain person and just realizing that you can find happiness within yourself with the person that you have been, but now you've discovered that person. I'm just curious, have you, have you found a sense of relief there? A hundred percent. And your analogy was perfect about taking the equipment off and just feeling like, Oh, like you can mm-hmm. breathe again. Uh, it was truly remarkable. I, I shedded that, that old negative skin. Um, it was there. And then in the journey too, my mouth just opened up and I, I took a deep breath in and then I had the biggest exhale ever. And it was all my fears, anxiety, worries, depression was just being sucked out of me. Yeah. Um, it was again, just truly remarkable of just shedding the skin mm-hmm. um, and the layers that have built up over time. And now I get to, start on a clean canvas uh and start conditioning my brain without the negative effects of the pharmaceutical drugs um and then on top of doing my practicing and stuff like that that's how i'm just working on a daily daily grind to condition my brain how i want to be 
Yeah. I mean, you talk about the pharmaceutical drugs, you know, what I like to always say about that is I feel like they're meant to keep you on a hamster wheel. Like they, they give you just enough to keep moving on that hamster wheel, but you're, you're never given the opportunity to get off. You know, you just stay on it. So long as you, you take those pills every day, you're, you're moving on the hamster wheel, but again, you're not making any progress. You're not getting anywhere. Do you feel like you're in a place right now where, you know, you've stepped off that hamster wheel and maybe you've got now a clear road that you can, you know, sort of go down now and, and make what you want within your life? Yes, a hundred percent. I'm off the wheel and my eyes are wide open now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was telling Riley, you know, a couple weeks ago, last time we talked was like uh, my street across the, across from my house. I never knew the name of that street until I got back from Jamaica because my head was down all the time. Every time yeah. I went for a walk or like that. Now I'm up, I'm curious, I'm looking, you know, uh, at nature a little bit different. I'm just in tune in, in the moment and, and a lot more present. Again, I'm not on a pink cloud all the time. Like, it, but it's, it's unlocked me and now allowing me to get off that wheel, mm -hmm. to explore new things, to be the best version of Kevin Colley that I want to be. Um, and you just got to practice it. And that's just what I'm doing and trying to be disciplined to, uh, do my meditating, my working out to start my day off. Right. Uh, I do rely on, um, God and religion, uh, right now, uh, as well too, which is, is helping me out. I think they kind of go hand not hand in hand, but pretty, pretty close. Um, oh. uh, so yeah, just, uh, now that I can see clearly, um, and I'm intrigued with a lot of things in life now, don't, now I'm trying, like, I just get overwhelmed because I want to try to figure out a lot. I'm thinking for myself for the first time in 18 years where I was so um, insecure and masked by the pharmaceutical drugs. I didn't know if I was doing the right thing, doing the wrong thing, saying the right thing, saying the wrong, you know, like it was yeah. just now I'm, I'm just, all right, like this is pretty awesome. Like life is pretty cool here, but now I've got all this flood of new things coming in that's sticking with me this time. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to decipher um, and not get overwhelmed because yeah. now I'm, I'm, I'm seeing all this information coming in and I'm loving it. I'm just trying to not get overwhelmed with now my brain's actually absorbing all this information. Yeah, it's almost like getting thrown into an entirely new body. I mean, that's how it was for me, you know, and it's like, you're you're in this new body, you got to kind of learn how to walk again and, and learn how to do things. But there's such a feeling of optimism. And like, again, this like weightlessness that you're not dragging along this trauma and all of this baggage along with you and that you can actually do what you want to do, but it takes time to adjust. Uh, there's an adjustment period. And again, it's like you have all these new feelings and thoughts coming and it's all great, but being able to take all of them and make sense of it, of course, and then figure out how you want to go about tackling each of those things. Is there anything, Kevin, that, that excites you the most about entering this new chapter of your life here? I mean, you're, you're still young, you know, early forties here, you still got a lot, you know, years ahead of you. Is there anything in particular now that really excites you about looking ahead uh, to the future? What really excites me is going to be able to share my story. Yeah. Uh, and again, if I can help one person, because if Raleigh didn't share his story and just my son didn't listen to Sean Ryan's podcast when he's talking about psychedelics, honestly, I don't know if I would have come out of that rabbit hole. I, I don't think I would have. Uh, so I'm, truly blessed that I've come out on this side and now I I get to I understand um to be in a good mental spot and to be grounded anybody that's in a good peaceful mindset they practice they do yoga they or they pray or they whatever they do that works for for that individual it works and so it just opened my mind to you put in the practice and you're grateful and thankful and, and you pray and you do your meditating and you work out and you get active and get moved even before you have breakfast, you're, you're starting your day off. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, it's, it's a work in progress. It is practice. It's 
uh, me now trying to find what kind of bandwidth my brain can keep taking this information in. I get to see where, uh, how much I can test myself when I'm working out now. Um, before I would give in, now I'm doing more. Um, it's just, it's just such a new experience. I'm not going to get those 18 years back since my injury, but I'm trying to make the next 25, 30, 35, whatever years, the best years of my life. And um, it's going to take practice and hard work. But what I wanted out of this, if I can help one person would just share my story of, of the ups and downs, a lot of downs um, that started with my injury and and here i am now after psychedelics that i can say i thought i was the most effed up person to walk that's how you feel when you're in that rabbit hole and to come out of it knowing that i'm in a, a much better spot um it's unlocked me and now it's just on me to do the practice uh and what i can be the best version of kevin Colley if i want to be yeah. nothing's holding me back now I'm off the wheel and I'm ready to go. Yeah, I love it. And I mean, I think it's so important. I want to highlight it, you know, having you share your story, you know, having the, you know, being able to come out and be comfortable with sharing your struggles, you know, your low points. I think it's important because it does resonate and it helps connect with individuals out there. And one of the things that, you know, Riley and I discussed, you know, when we first connected was the stigma of, of being, you know, having to be this tough guy, being, being a man alone, you know, you're not supposed to cry, uh, you know, you're not supposed to show emotion and having some of the toughest individuals out there, such as yourself, Riley, and, and some of the other, you know, professional athletes that have come out and shared their stories and being able to come out and put their stories out there on a platform. I think it's, it's helping to connect with a lot of other people out there who have maybe been hesitant about wanting to admit that, Hey, I need help. But seeing other tough guys, you know, come out and do it, I think is helping uh, get them to a point where they feel comfortable enough to seek the help that they need. So I want to thank you, you know, Kevin, for, for again, putting your story out here on a platform and sharing it. I know it's not easy, um, but thank you again. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, again, I, I just want to share my story. Been through a lot. If I can help one person, in, there, there's avenues out there. Uh I would love to get with uh, whoever's out there that wants to contact me and give you more information about Wake and, and Jamaica and what the uh, psychedelic retreat did. It was life changing for me. Um, again, I'm not on a pink cloud, still life changing. Now I just, I'm, I've got the tools to figure life out now where yeah. before I, I couldn't figure it out. Um, and it's just truly beautiful, mind blowing, best experience of my life. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Well, again, Kevin, thank you so much. Um, always welcome to come back here on the show. Uh, we look forward to to talking again here. But again, if anybody's listening to this or watching this and they're interested in Wake or connecting directly with Kevin, please do reach out to us and we can make that happen. So thank you again so much. Please. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.